Okay. Welcome everyone. I'm Megan Young. I use she and her pronouns. I've co I've corresponded with most of you in this room, and I'm just so thrilled to have you here and to be presenting. Um, I've been super humbled to see your work and just like blown away by the amount of knowledge and expertise that like is in this room right now and just been astounded by the things you've done and learned and shared and uh, just really grateful. So thank you for sharing all that with me and for sharing that with each other. I just wanna start off by acknowledging that we're on the unceded territory of the Western Abenaki people and that those people continue to steward the land today that we live on. And a lot of you have had really deep personal relationships with the land and people this summer through your experiences. So I think starting our or night to night and not just like grounding and that understanding is a really good way to kick it off. So we're going to start off with Julia Bolton. I'm going to click for you. Yeah, so you can see what you'd like. Hey, I'm Julia. Um, I do she, her pronouns. And I was the stewardship assistant intern with the Nature Conservancy this past summer. For those of you who don't know, um, the Nature Conservancy is a global environmental nonprofit um, that kind of works to conserve lands and waters on which all that depends. So where was I? What was I doing? Um, next slide. Yeah, so I did a lot of different things. Um, I was based out of Montpelier in the Northern office, but I was just kind of all around the state every week. Um, so some of like, the major things that I did this summer was a lot of monitoring um, TNC easements and preserves which just basically means that I'm walking around the land and then decide, or I guess just see whether that property is in compliance with um, TNC, TNC um, regulations and standards and then write a report about it afterwards. So that was a big chunk. The other big chunk was general like trail work, trail maintenance, invasive species removal all around the state. And then the other big component to this internship revolved around like community partnership and involvement. So lots of like working with volunteers, building punching, checking in on other like volunteers, working around um, TNC preserves, and also being a part of like little field trips um, for folks to like learn about um, lady slippers and stuff like that. So that was like the major parts. And then on top of that, it was really cool because I had the opportunity to kind of like learn about the various research projects happening around the office and get involved through like collecting data um, or yeah, like building exposures for like what comes next kind of thing. And then on top of that, I also ate a lot of creamies, which was really fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, what I learned, I guess generally how to obviously monitor easements and preserves and write um, professional reports about that. Um, also, I got really comfortable using GIS um, in the field on various devices and apps, which was very helpful. Um, my plant ID got a lot better, which is nice. Um, and I also learned a lot how to communicate with um, various landowners, volunteers, and community partners, which I think is really important. But I think overall, the main takeaway for me was like, it was really cool to be able to, um, I guess, just connect with various folks around the office um, in other departments and then kind of get to understand like what is an environmental nonprofit, what do they do and what would working there work like? And is that something that I'm interested in? I still don't know what I'm interested in. Probably, but, <laughs> okay. but yeah, so big thank you to the Nature Conservancy, to Rubenstein and the donors for making this possible. And yeah, thanks y'all. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Denise, I teach her pronouns, I'm a senior environmental science student and this summer um, I worked with a PhD student in Tony D'Amato's lab looking at deadwood decomposition in forests. Um, um, so the objective of my internship was to understand how different forest sand harvesting techniques um, differ in severity impact the decomposition of deadwood. Um, and we had a couple metrics to understand decomposition, including fungal diversity, fungal biomass, mass loss, and carbon to nitrogen ratios. And we obtained these metrics using 11 inch long wood stakes that were made of white pine and sugar maple. Um, and some other goals of the internship were 
conducting, just learning to conduct lab techniques, practicing data analysis and visualization, and designing my own research projects. This is the Aiken Forestry Sciences Lab, as some of you may know, it's on Spear Street, and it's where I uh, conducted my internship. Oh, I have a bunch of photos on this slide. Yeah. Um, what I actually ended up doing was um, towards the beginning of the summer, we collected wood stakes that had been in the ground at a site called Second College Grant in Northern New Hampshire for five years. Um, after that, I processed them by drilling into them on the back of this truck here. Um, and the wood shavings were what we conducted the analyses on. And then, can you keep clicking? Thank you. One more. <laughs> And this is me uh, using a table saw to cut those wood stakes I mentioned. Um, and in the middle here is what the wood stakes look like when they're like freshly deployed. That's what they might look like after five years under the duff layer. <laughs> and this here is um, an enzyme assay setup. I don't really have time to go into that, but the purpose was to determine like what the limiting nutrient in the wood stakes were. Next. I did some other things besides um, my own research. Um, this was me helping the cold air pooling project um, at Bartlett, New Hampshire. At their time, this is me like putting tea bags under the ground to look at like decomposition processes. Okay, you're gonna have to <laughs> click past the data because I don't have time to explain it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <Going>. <laughs> Um, what I do want to explain is the ongoing research that we're doing. Um, so we have soil, we have soil samples from our sites, um, and we're going to get carbon values from those and see how that changes across the treatment plots of like, I didn't explain the treatment plots, but there's like, um, just like increasing in severity. And I want to correlate the soil carbon data with like mass loss data to see if fungi are returning carbon to the soil through decomposition. And um, we also are going to get DNA, our DNA analysis results back from the lab at some point. And when that happens, we want to correlate um, the fungal diversity um, with the decomposition rates to see if the literature is correct about like um, decomposition decreasing with increased fungal diversity, which is an interesting, um, an interesting thing that I don't have time to get into. Um, but yeah, that was my internship. On the next slide, I have some thank yous to, this is the older version of my presentation, guys, I'm so sorry, but thank you to my research supervisor, Tony D'Amato, my um, uh, faculty sponsor, and Megan Young for putting this together. I love data, so I'm going to definitely bug you about those tables for sure. All right, next up, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Zobler. I use her pronouns, and I did my uh, credit internship with Vermont Housing and Conservation Board this summer. Actually, like, if it will play, mm -hmm. I just love video. This is just like a quick snapshot of what we did. And I was actually on the field that day. It's not going to have sound. Oh, it is. With Julia. <laughs> we got in the park. So this is not bushwhacking, which we have to do a lot for our jobs. And that was like the most common thing that was happened. We just these and track them just to understand forest health and that was a cat that was really scary actually. I almost hit it. And then you can go to the next slide. Um, so my internship consisted of two main things. It was infield monitoring and remote monitoring. And for the infield, I got to explore a lot of beautiful Vermont la natural landscapes. And I was just mainly checking for invasive species and property encroachment or damaging human activity, um, and just taking pictures to monitor the progress of the property over a few years. And I typically hiked two to five miles a day, which was crazy. And I was very reliant on a GPS device that was on an iPad to get me in and out of the easements and not trust us. <laughs> and the next slide is about the remote monitoring I did was for easements that I could access by foot or that I just didn't have time to go to by the end of the summer. And I did this by taking data from BCGI and putting it into ArcGIS, overlaying, overlaying the data 
layer that had the outlines of the easements, putting on a grid and then going square by square, and just making sure that there was no like areas of interest or things that looked like people building properties uh, within the easement. And then the work was super important because the HD is a funding organization, so they provide funds for conservation groups around the state to actually purchase land to become an easement. And so I was just essentially making sure that no third parties were breaking any of the rules that were originally stated within the easements um, terms and regulations, essentially. And then, yes, yeah, so my areas of learning were all these listed. My biggest one was that I actually got to make the process of remote monitoring like I put it from like originally three hours, it took me to like one hour at the end. So I got that process down to a science, which was really cool. Um, and then I got to learn about the political processes and that kind of piqued my interest a lot. And then yeah, my key takeaways were that I enhanced my time management a lot. I had to do my full entire workflow myself and dictate my own schedule, which was actually much more difficult than I thought it would be. And I gained important communication skills. I had to communicate with a lot of different professionals in the field. And I learned a ton about Vermont landscapes and I gained a ton of familiarity with our GIS and some like real world application for that. So yeah, anyways, thank you so much. That's how we Hello everybody, I'm David Orley. I'm a senior in the fourth program and I was the uh, steward for the forest and the urban scene research forest. Okay, so my description of the job was uh, support for education, research, and demonstration of forest conservation, management, and all for the research forest. I mainly stuck with Wolcott, Talcott, and Washington because Jericho was too huge. Um, most of the internship was assisting a crew with CFI and the three smaller forests, as I said. And I also did admin maintenance throughout the forest. And I also did independent data collection for legacy trees and special natural man-made features. So for CFI, I worked with these beautiful individuals here from <laughs> left to right. We have Liv Parker and then Miriam was the lead. And there I am with the tree. And I love my food and stuff. <laughs> uh, we basically just took an inventory of herbaceous species down woody material and tree species from saplings to mature growth. Um, within fixed radius plots of each of the three smaller forests. Uh, the data can be used to track various attributes of, of the forest to help determine future management of these forests. Um, we use all those various tools down there, calipers, EVH, hammer, paint, I'd say uh, DME cruiser, which is basically just like a, a radar with a little clicker that tells you the distance from the trees to the center of the plot, and Avenza on my phone and RTS Pro. Uh, here's us on one of the best plots of the, uh, the forest there. Uh, this is my independent data collection here. Um, so what is a legacy tree? Um, but the, USD, uh, the USDA describes it as old trees that have not been spared, or that have been spared during harvest or have survived stand replacing natural disturbances. Snags can be a uh, legacy as well. Um, so my focus was collecting data on Avenza, the, the app that you get on your phone. Um, for special features such as legacy trees. And I, I recorded the species DBH, and this data can be used for research uh, assistance for developing management objectives and or used as an education medium. And uh, that was a red, or, a red oak, almost 50 inch DBH. Okay. Uh, so these are the, the map layouts that I created. Um, all those points I took on Avenza and I translated them to ArcGIS and overlaid them to uh, the, some of the data that we have in the Rubenstein um, portal and you know just pretty much described what I found in the various legends. Um, in, to in total there were almost 120 legacy trees throughout the three small forests. Reflection, um, field data collection, CFI, uh, more experience with ArcGIS, species recognition and chainsaw use when I did some maintenance. Of, uh, Wolcott. Um, so the convenience of this was it was only 20 hours per week. I had summer courses that I needed to take. So I could go and you know do some CFI and then also get some uh, classwork done. Uh, improvements I have, um, it was a transitional year, um, but I, I talked with Jess Weichel about this. Um, it's going to be a little more hands-on with foresters and research for the following years. So thank you very much uh, to Rubenstein and all those who helped me. Yeah. To walk around in the woods, I also saw a moose. Incredible, <laughs> I've never seen one.
<laughs> and there's the 50 inch CVH uh, for the Chinook. So pretty huge. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Benny Berkenpotter at UC Hill Front House and I'm a senior environmental science major. And this summer I got to have the pleasure of working at the UVM Spatial Analysis Lab right here in the Rubenstein School as part of the UAS or Unoccupied Aircraft Systems team. Over the course of the summer, I got to develop and learn a bunch of different skills within the UAS field. Um, the most exciting part for me was being able to go out in the field and fly drones to collect imagery for different uh, purposes and projects all across Vermont. Um, it got to a point where I got to fly my very first drone and even plan my own missions, which is super cool. Um, but besides that, I got to work in the lab and sit on my computer and process the imagery, which I'll talk about in a bit. And through that, I got to learn a, bit, a bunch of different software and be a lot more comfortable with it. And through that, I was allowed to uh, I was able to familiarize myself with a lot of different technologies, which included the drones themselves, the different software that I was using, and also the different technologies that I was using to make a, uh, our jobs easier as a UAS team, such as iPads that we use to create checklists to make sure that we had everything. All right. Um, in tandem with all these different projects, I was also able to participate in creating different content and running workshops that the staff provides, uh, one of which, and one of our biggest projects for the summer, was a FEMA workshop to teach first responders how to um, use UAS technology for, for disaster responses. Um, it was a huge learning curve for me because not only did I have to create the content and present it in the, as an instructor, but I also have to learn the content for myself, which I had never learned before. Um, so like I said before, I had to learn a lot of different software. Um, two of which are Pix4D and DroneScript, which are those two on the left or over there. And these are photogrammetry software. Photogrammetry is the process in which we take the images that we collect on the field and stitch them together so that we have cohesive maps and that we can deliver to our clients. Um, I've never heard of photogrammetry prior to this, and it was super cool to learn more about it. And I was even able to co-run a lecture for one of our lectures about photogrammetry in front of different professionals, which is awesome. Um, besides that, I also got to work a lot with ArcGIS Pro, um, and it was super cool also to have a connection between the classes that I've taken in ArcGIS Pro and also a real life connection with that as well. Of course, the most important part is I got to work with a wonderful group of people through, through the staff and also with the clients and the different people that we were running our workshops with. Um, I had the great opportunity of working with three different perennial interns from the past. Um, which are the Karens, Maddie Zimmering, Lauren, who's right over there, and then me, and a bunch of different folks from the South. And it was really awesome to learn from their experiences and from what they're doing as work, and then what I could do to improve myself too. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> My name is Lucas Goldplus. I was uh, at the honor of working on ECRPC, which stands for the County Regional Planning Commission this summer. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, just a quick overview of what it is. It is essentially a link between towns and municipalities in the state. Um, so they work to facilitate projects such as energy, water quality, transportation engineering, transportation planning, um, and a bunch of other zoning, zoning projects. Um, and yeah, I worked in the water quality sector, so I don't know much about the other ones. But um, what I did was work on that MRGP permit. I guess to preface it, it is a um, permit that became active as a result of the Clean Water Act, um, Act 64. And um, essentially what it, what it serves to do is bring roadways up to compliance with DEC standards because water quality professionals were seeing lots of runoff of phosphorus phosphorus, nitrogen, winter material, sediment, and other um, harmful pollutants that were running off um, from gravel roads. So what we did is we would go out um, and work with town officials, highway foremen, um, and town representatives to uh, facilitate the projects and, um, and help them kind of bring the roads up to compliance with uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation Standards. So times we're saying, you know, we can't afford this, pro like we can't afford these projects, the construction is too much, we don't have the means um, or financial stability to do it. So what VTrans did is they stepped in and pulled a bunch of money together to um, help towns with hydrologically connected roadways um, 
facilitate these projects and bring these roads up to standards. Um, so I got to kind of work to facilitate the grant program as well as, you know, go out and survey segments to uh, and essentially speak with towns. Yeah, you know, the next slide. Um, so this is just an example of a road that, you know, did not meet standards at all. There's farm issues and erosion issues. Um, so the best, the BMP or best management practice that we would use is just recrown the roadway and uh, reestablish some soil in the ditch. This is in Williston and uh, this is another um, segment that was in Essex, which obviously is not as bad as this one, but partially meets standards, and we would just remove the burn and stone line ditch the area. So, yeah. My supervisor over there, this is just um, an example of a ditch that's in progress. It still needs to be stone lined. Um, and this is just another picture of a segment. I didn't do a great job of taking pictures. <laughs> And this is the uh, RGIS Pro dashboard. It's good. You can kind of see there's green segments, yellow segments, and red segments. Um, I was working in this mostly just to uh, monitor how segments um, are brought up to compliance by the year. So green means meets, yellow means partially meets, and red means does not meet at all. So we kind of use this um, to, we, we would print out uh, like little screenshots of it and bring it to town officials and highway foreman to show them, you know, where they need to uh, to do their construction work. So yeah, and this is just a zoomed in portion part of the dashboard. So this is uh, in Wellston and this has a bunch of different stuff going on, but one segment that meets one that partially meets the two that doesn't meet at all. So yeah, that's it. That was my internship. So. <laughs> Yeah. All right, Laszlo. Hello, everyone. My name is Laszlo. I'm a junior in the Regional School, natural resource major. And this summer, I was the Middlebury Area Land Trust. So, the Middlebury Area Land Trust conserves a lot of land from private uh, farms and fields, forests, wetlands. Uh, they have up to 30 miles of trail, infamously known as the Tam Trail around Middlebury. And a couple of different suspension bridges and there's the Otter Creek River that runs through it. My job this summer was to maintain a lot of these trails and different bridges. Whether in the you know next slide in the morning it was weed whipping, uh, invasive species like buckthorn, honeysuckle, and working on these bridges, or working with volunteer groups to build boardwalks that were in very marshy areas. And every morning was very different. We did a lot of different stuff. Uh, this is just a picture of like, you know, before, once it's all cut and once we cleared, did a lot of that. And uh, every morning was really different, whether it was cutting trees that bikers supported from falling on the trails or going around. That's uh, one of our farmers, John, going and flagging a different trail. Uh, we did a lot of boardwalks in this picture. We, um, there was one project that was super deep into the trail system that instead of carrying like, bunch of lumber, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and we canoed it in, which was super fun. Got to do that. Uh, I did a lot of work with kids. There's a lot of mall summer camps, and some mornings I was with them. A lot of education, inclusivity, and uh, learning how to respect each other and nature, and that was a lot of fun. And then in the afternoons, one of my favorite parts is I probably made like at least 50 of these guys. <laughs> Different trail signs going around. Uh, just being in there and doing the art and going up, people stole a lot of these. Uh, so getting those in and uh, different tree ID, red maple, black cherry, just going up and listing different species. That was fun in the afternoon. That was really what I did. And here's some fun pictures, different critters and shout out Caleb and his dog Kava. That was great. Uh, off picture, I got to do a lot of other fun stuff like sitting in at trail committee meetings, uh, working with different landowners to see land that they can serve. Yeah. That's about it. Had a great time. Um, hi, my name is Gwen Slotin. I use she, her pronouns. And this summer, I worked at the UVM Entomology Lab, not with me at Bugs, but we did we're doing research on agrivoltaic systems using novel vertical bifacial solar arrays, which is kind of a mouthful. <laughs> a little bit. 
So Aggregal Takes, and in case you haven't heard of it, is something, it has a lot of different names. A lot of Vermont farmers call it solar farming, um, but there's also Agro Photovoltaics, AV, it goes by a lot of names. Um, so what it is, is using the same land for both agriculture and to produce solar energy. And there's a lot of like benefits to this practice. Um, it increases land productivity by almost 200% in some studies, which is more money for farmers and a more stable income for farmers too, in case crops fail. Um, it also alleviates competition over land between solar production and agriculture. And as like arable land is kind of diminishing, that's becoming a giant issue, especially with a push towards solar energy. Um, it also, some studies have shown it can decrease water use because you're uh, increasing some shading, but um, that reduces, uh, uh, Word there, but it can reduce water use because they're getting less evapotranspiration. Um, and also, most studies have shown a very minimal impact on yield. So, the research is led by um, PhD candidate Laura Ekman. It's a very long three year study. This year um, was just the reference plots at the UVM Horticultural Farm, which is the site. If you were ever around there, there's a big plaque that says what we're doing. Um, so what we did is we planted carrots, beets, lettuce, peas, and green beans, and we chose these crops based on their suitability for agrivel take systems and their suitability to Vermont farmers. So our Vermont farmers are already using these crops, and this is like a um, sustainable and useful practice for Vermont farmers. Um, so what I did was I participated by being a laboratory assistant. So that started with reviewing literature to help figure out what crops would actually be best. So just a lot of reading. Um, and then I also created a pest disease identification guide to use in the field because it is an organic farm. So we weren't using pesticides or um, herbicides, things like that. Um, I also assisted with the bed preparation and the seeding for our plot, which was actually pretty fun. We used like a little roller seeder, which I enjoyed. Um, and I was also solely responsible for the cultivation and care of the plot which took up most of my time. So I did a lot of weeding this summer. I put on my podcast and it was actually kind of nice. Um, and I also was responsible for harvesting and washing the mature crops. So far we've harvested the beets and on Friday we are due to harvest the rest of the crops, which is exciting. Um, and I also gathered or helped out gather um, yield data on the beets. So mass, um, circumference, things like that. And so I learned a lot this summer. Um, I did a lot of different things. It was really interesting. I obviously learned how to grow a variety of vegetables and at like large-ish scale. It's always been like backyard farming, so this is a new experience for me. Um, I also gained a really strong understanding of small-scale farming practices, benefits, and challenges, especially with the organic farming, because we did have an issue with flea beetles for a while there. Um, and I also acquired a good insight to how research is actually conducted, like in real life, not just kind of reading research papers. Um, I also saw what a career in academic research looks like because the UVM Entomology Lab is very, very small. So it was like a very intimate setting and I was really able to like see what the PhD um, faculty were doing on the day to day. And then I also developed a strong knowledge and understanding of IPM practices because it was the Entomology Lab. So they were talking about your alphabet bugs. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, I'm Izzy Anderson. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a junior right now um, environmental science major here at Rubenstein. So I was working this summer at the Rubenstein Ecosystem Science Lab. It's the lab down by ECHO. It's like in the same building. I'm sure a lot of you know where it is. I know I've been to like little trips there and stuff. Um, and I was working as a research assistant on the phones project. So essentially this project is looking at how Fish and nutrient treatments will impact zooplankton daily migration patterns. Um, so yeah, zooplankton play a pretty big role in food webs. There are a lot of different animals' food source. So in differences in their daily migration patterns will have a big impact on different trophic uh, nutrient levels. Um, yes. So. Uh, my main focus this summer was sample analysis. I was a research assistant, so that was pretty much all of my time. This is actually me doing some microscope work here with one of my supervisors. 
Um, and essentially, I was identifying zooplankton. So, so we would go through every sample for every lake that we had taken samples from and count minimum 200 rotifers. So rotifers are just like uh, a small phylum of freshwater zooplankton. So they're just kind of an indicator of a larger picture. Um, and we were identifying the genus level, and there were 30 genera identified, or 33. And then here's the next slide. Here are some common rotifers. There are a lot of different ones. Like I said, there are 33 of these. Um, and my job was basically just to know what all of them were and be able to identify them just by looking through a microscope. Um, and yeah, they're all very different from each other, but some of them look very similar. It's kind of a difficult job, but once you get into it, it goes pretty fast. So what I learned this summer, I learned a lot about the academic research process. I was a research assistant, so I got to see a pretty, pretty intimately what that research process looks like. Over the summer, it was a lot of sample analysis processing, but right now we have finished analyze, or finished taking the data. So I'm still working there for the fall, and we're working on different statistical analyses to analyze our data, which is exciting because we don't really know what's going to happen with it. Um, and yeah, it was cool to just see how the lab functions. There's a lot of collaboration between the different PhD students there, and all the projects were really different. So I was working on my specific one, but I also got to see how all of the different ones were functioning as well. Okay. How do you all feel about like a one minute stretch break? Yeah, you want to do a stretch break and then we'll have everyone. We'll start with sorry. <laughs> I tried to get it before you got up. I was like, <laughs> well, no one's stretching either. So I don't know. We'll get some food. It's like crossing in the rest of my legs together. All right, are you guys ready? Ready to rock? Yeah. Okay. You have to like squeeze and not be too real. Or you can do yeah, one for you. Okay. I'll just like over here. That'll work. Over here. That'll be fun. Okay. All right. Hello. And for our summer internship, we work with the Bird Friendly Naval Project. My name is Lucas Rousseau. I use the and pronouns. I'm a forestry senior. I'm also a forestry senior. Uh, my name is Peru. And I use he, him pronouns as well. I'm Alex Durham. I use he, him pronouns. I am a forestry major. <laughs> uh, before we get into our summer internship, I'd like to highlight the main mission of the Bird Friendly Maple Project, which is it aims to recognize and promote proper sugar bush management that supports Vermont's birds, forests, and forest based economy by sampling various sugar bushes around Vermont and assessing their capability of like sustaining bird populations. Uh, it got cut off a little bit, but um, basically we're gonna split up what we did over the summer aside from hiking, which took up, like we were just joking, probably took up 70% of our time. Um, we did four main things, which were vegetation surveys, arthropod surveys, arthropod sample collection, which is slightly different than the surveys, and also using Seek and just looking at some plants for fun. So first I'd like to talk about the vegetation surveys we've done. Um, so they consisted of a center intensive plot and three subplots. So here we have the center plot. Um, it consisted of an 11.3 meter radius where we sampled all overstory trees and snags, and here 
is Drew up in a tree trying to measure this uh, wonky growing sugar maple correctly. And also we have three nested subplots within here that were 5.5 meters along each transect, which ran uh, 0 degrees, 420, and 240 degrees. And here we recorded all saplings and shrub species that were present. And also on transects that were at 60, 180, and 300 degrees, we had three quadrats that were one by one meter. And here we recorded all seedling and herbaceous cover. Um, for subplots, we had three of them that were 20 meters out from the center. And here they were very variable radius plots. We used a um, angle gauge to measure and record all overstory trees and snags. And we also estimated the down woody material and woody vegetation. All right, and in our extended plots, we had out here, and I get to update the picture, but we had extended plots that were our arthropod sampling um, plots. At the, beginning, at the center of each of these, also on these transects, we had a little 16 by 16 centimeter piece of cardboard that was placed there and left for two weeks. And after two weeks, I had the, well, I mainly had the wonderful job of walking around the woods to um, like miles and miles each day to uncover each little piece of cardboard and count all little bugs or not just bugs. So this is called an arthropod sampling plot, but it really just was any sort of bird food. So anything like birds can eat, like as you can see the settlement, here's some different slugs and things. And um, so after two weeks, we, I looked at that, took all that data down and then replaced the cardboard with the new piece of cardboard, did another two weeks. And then after that, all that data is going to be compiled into biomass data to see what um, kind of um, how much food is there for the avian species on in this area in this forest. So uh, this was the part of the research that I did a lot of, but it's pretty easily explained by this first photo. I hope all of you guys can see it. This is from Alex's Be Real. Um, it sums it up pretty quick. You take a shot back into the woods and vacuum leaves. What we did basically, we took this this vacuum, you shoved it into like a big backpack and you walked out to those subplots, the infamous subplots that have been mentioned over and over and over again because there's so many of them. There are three of those subplots at 0, 120, and 240. So you go out 20 meters to the center of that subplot and then from there you walk out, it says 1.5, or it says 1.5, you walk out 5 meters and then you have a 1 meter radius from the point you're standing 5 meters at, at like 60, 180 and 300. So there are nine subplots for every plot that you do. And all you do there is go around and vacuum every leaf on every woody species you see, get sucked up into the vacuum, and once you've done all nine, you throw them into a bag, take those home, put them in the freezer. Later on, they go to the forestry sciences laboratory that was mentioned earlier, and they get put in these little tins. Later on, they're like compiled into data similar to what, what Lucas was doing, but it's more about the character of the actual bird feed that you can get in the woods instead of the biomass. And lastly, we just wanted to share with you guys some of the cool stuff we saw this summer. There was a lot of uh, a lot of walking around and looking up, but you also did get to look down a bunch. This is probably my favorite thing I saw the whole summer. One day we were all like split up and Lucas just sent me a text message with coordinates. He's like chicken in the woods. And so I walked to this spot and I had that for dinner with my roommates later. Um, tucked in this corner here. This is a threatened species in Vermont. It's a mink frog. It's like, it's honestly not that much smaller than it looks on the screen. It's like a really big frog. Um, I saw that in Newark, Vermont, which was really cool. I also saw that broad winged hawk. There were two of them. There was a male and a female in Newark. And um, it's not a bear. My favorite thing I saw the whole summer was that crested wood fern on the top left. I think it's really beautiful. I don't know if you guys want to share a bit. Yeah, I mean, we saw this. This is probably my favorite fern, the maiden hair fern. Yeah, we saw it like this really pretty. I think it was a lesser purple orange orchid, but it was it was really really cool. We sat there for a little bit trying to figure it out. A lot of plant identification happening too. Yeah. Well, thank you guys.
Uh, hi, my name is Isabella, and this summer I was brought out of Vermont and to the New Zealand Planning Council, which is an environmental nonprofit um, focused on education and advocacy and land preservation. Um, mostly I was doing water quality sampling. I went out every week to three different ponds across the island, all of which were in some different areas. Um, Gibbs was neighboring a cranberry bog. Well, Kapam and Washing were surrounded by uh, really rich homes that uh, use a lot of fertilizer. And this was really fun. I finally got to go out and sample everything on my own. My only previous experience had been in linology, and it's kind of different having like the big boat do all of the water quality analysis. Um, so I was out in a kayak every day, sampling for temperature, depth, transparency, salt oxygen. Um, and every week I also sampled for harmful algae blooms, which was also in the previous picture. Uh, Nantucket has a lot of harmful algae problems, which was surprising to me because <laughs> I didn't really assume that there would be much or agriculture there, but there was a lot of fertilizer use with all of the um, really big properties. So in collaboration with six other nonprofits on island and the town's natural resource department, we sampled all of the ponds. The town does the big lawn ponds, um, but all the other nonprofits uh, sampled the other ponds. I would take uh, water quality samples from the center of the ponds and then wherever the wind directed all the algae into the coves, and I would run an abraxas test. And if I got a hit for antitoxin A or microcystin, I would send a sample for further analysis, which brings me to my research proposal, which was on microcystin poisoning. Um, microcystin is a hepatotoxin, which affects the liver. And in Gibbs, with all of the cranberry bog fertilizer, it was found to have 2,000 times the EPA limit. EPA limit is eight nanograms per milliliter, and Gibbs had 16,000. Um, my supervisor coined it the most toxic pond in New England. Um, so I set up a research proposal with the Conservation Foundation, which was on island, and we developed a agreement where the land council could sample dead birds and fish that were found, um, and they're going to be further analyzed um, to see if the microcystin is the reason for death or if it's like low dissolved oxygen levels associated with HABs. Other experiences. The Land Council is working on eelgrass restoration, and so we have two different half acre sites. Um, the past three years, they've been doing transplants, and so we call it underwater gardening, which is really fun. Um, but now they're working on seeding, and so transferring the seeds. Um, and yeah, I did some other fun ones. But yeah, so thank you, Land Council was a really great host, and I got exposed to a lot of things. Um, and then we're going to see donors. Okay, so I'm Mark, and um, this summer I work as an ecological restoration technician for Ecologic, which is located in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, so, uh, Ecologic primarily just works to improve the sustainability of urban areas as well as working to restore natural landscapes. So, um, ecological restoration is primarily carried out in um, places like forests, prairies, wetlands, um, all of the landscapes you can find in the Midwest. And, we did this by mostly planting native plants and then physically and chemically controlling invasives. Um, and then for, <clears throat> sorry, I'm <laughs> getting over some allergies. Um, for green infrastructure, it's definitely more urban work and it's kind of just like a commercial gardening with like a little environmental twist. <laughs> Still fun, but I definitely prefer just walking in the woods. Um, so um, every day we I had to be there at 7 a.m. and then five days a week, 50 hours a week. That was super insane, super intense. But what I really loved about it was that it was something new. 
every single day. No day was the same, and for better or worse, but it was always a new site, a new plant. It was so, so much fun. There's so much to do, and I got so much exposure to different restoration techniques, and my company even sponsored me in getting my Office of the Indiana State Chemist Pesticide Applicator License, which is required to apply chemical commercially. Um, and that being said, I do think that my proudest accomplishment was learning how to drive and then subsequently back up a truck and trailer, because that's insane. <laughs> Not intuitive at all. Uh, <laughs> But I did it. And then um, the impact of the work was obviously also really cool. Um, you can see right here, like um, this is die off of uh, Canada thistle, which we had treated two weeks prior. And it's just really cool to go back to sites and see like, oh, cool. I am killing this super invasive, aggressive plant that's going to take over this prairie. But it's not because I did something. <laughs> and, and like with the fawn and the bird eggs, it's like this was in the middle of a uh, very urban park and this bird is raising their family and it's super cute and the fawn is that was in a wetland that used to be an ag field that we had restored um that plant right there that was the coolest day ever um so if you don't know that is golden seal which is a somewhat rare native plant and I actually ended up finding and documenting that, and it was found in a place that was um, we've been working on for the past 10 years, and this was the first time we found it. So, super cool. And uh, one last thing, this is a combined sewage overflow wetland, which what it does is it's a new technology that's only being used in a couple places around the country. And it takes wastewater of all different kinds and filters it through. And by the time it comes out on the other side, it is as clean or cleaner than the way it's been, than it, if it would have come out of a treatment plant. And we were planting native grasses to uh, help facilitate that. So thank you. Keep it going back. Hi, I'm Abby. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm an environmental studies senior, also in the accelerated master's program. I'm going to be starting back the semester. So I had the privilege this summer of being one of the Rubin students perennial interns, and I worked with the Vermont Land Trust as a community forest demonstration intern. And so I kind of did a plethora of things, which I really enjoyed. Um, since I was a community demonstration intern, that meant that I was kind of used to like help either initiate or continue projects that the Vermont Land Trust just doesn't have time for, and these projects were the community centered. So one of them, the like, main thing I did was inventorying invasive plant species at town forests. Uh, and these town forests had, had easements with the Vermont Land Trust. Um, I also worked at some wildlife management areas too, and this basically entailed me just bushwhacking through random parts of the woods, uh, looking for invasives, and any time I did, I would pull up ArcGIS field maps and just plot a point. Um, I also worked on writing up database entries for an upcoming town forest civil culture da database, which the intention is to create kind of more of a lay people speak, not like forestry professional speak, for either town forest um, managers or whomever that, you know, would like to know how to manage land. Um, I also got to do some assorted forestry tasks, such as um, treating ash trees by insecticide, which is in that picture, which was like a privilege to do. It was a cool experience. Um, yeah. And so here's some pictures from the summer. Um, yeah, this is one of the sites I worked at, and it was quite the slopes. <laughs> so that was, that was tough, but really fun. Um, in the bottom corner, I got to also work on some ecological tasks for a week. And we, there's this invasive grasses encroaching on some live stakes that were planted by a Vermont Land Trust AmeriCorps member. And so we kind of, the two of us went out there and whacked all of the grass to, to monitor the live stakes. We also got to do some stream restoration. So yeah, kind of what I learned are what forestry techniques are being implemented in Vermont, because like as an environmental studies student, that's not really something I get the privilege of always learning. Um, I also got to um, learn invasive plants, ID, um, habits, and management, and I actually got to treat um, the first site that I inventoried on my last week, which was really fun. 
very grueling. I don't know if management is my, my type of feat. Um, and then I also got to see what a forestry job can look like in different jobs within like wildlife management. Um, and I got to know like what all the field work entails and that that's something I want to do in the future, like getting ferns in your boot or having to go triple A. Um, but yeah, I got to see lots of wildlife, which is also great. So thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Jack Knight. I'm a senior in environmental science, and this summer I worked for the Bureau of Reclamation doing population surveys in the lower Rio Grande in New Mexico. And so our main surveys were of southwestern wild flycatchers, a uh, rather nondescript small flycatcher, which nests in very dense understory. That is pictured on the lower left. Um, the long and short of how we surveyed for both birds was we had a call on a speaker we would play it and just listen to see if it responded. Um, if the audio works, there is a call for that word bird. If not, that's fine. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> um, yeah. I will. Uh, I don't think it'll let me put it in, and you'll have that, to see That's it. perfectly fine. Okay. I'm sorry. But that bird could only be identified based on its call because it's very similar looking to several other species of flycatchers in the Rio Grande Basin. The yellow-billed cuckoo, however, nests in this large overstory of cottonwood. And it is much more visually distinctive being a foot long and very colorful as far as birds on the Rio Grande go. Um, the second part of my job is nest monitoring, which was uh, just for the fly catchers only. And for that, either myself or others would go to points of where the birds were recorded several times in the survey season and search for nests. So the picture on the lower left, if you click, I think that is the first nest I found this season. And on the right here, it's a bit hard to tell, but that is a picture of us surveying the nest. And the way we did that is we used a air compass attached to the end of a stick we just found lying around, and we would stick it up to see what was in the nest. So in that nest, there are four eggs, which is as many as the flycatchers would lay at one time. And so over the course of this survey, I learned a lot. I got a lot of practical field experience. Um, I've got a lot of practical RGIS experience and overall just had a lot of fun. And I could talk a lot more about it. So if you want to email me, it's jjknight at upm.edu. And if it sounds like fun to you at all, it's open to applications on USA Jobs in December. Thank you. We got Maddie. All right, hello everyone. My name is Maddie. I'm an environmental studies student, junior here at the Riverton School. Um, and this summer I worked on Mount Mansfield, which is um, on Abenaki land, also called Moosehead Mountain. Okay, so I will start by introducing this lovely building. It is the Visitor Center owned by Vail Ski Resorts, but currently run and operated by um, the Green Mountain Club. Inside here, we have the store, mainly where people go by to go on their hike to Mount Mansfield. Um, there's some brief history, some um, vegetation information, but mainly not a lot of information in a semi underfunded space. So, UVM has a proposed um, Mount Mansfield Science and Stewardship Center that would take the place of this research center, basically to get um, UVM community members, researchers, students, courses, all that to up to the mountain to Vermont's Alpine Tundra ecosystem. It is also the highest point. Um, and it was just one of your changes throughout our future um, in species richness, diversity, um, gradient changes, and species protection and interactions. 
And so my job with me over there with a sprained ankle. Um, I was sitting there with my surveys um, that we created in the beginning of the summer um, with some grad students, but I was trying to catch people on their way out, finishing their hike, and basically get their experience while being on the mountain, um, what they know, what they don't know, and what they want to learn more about. Um, and as you can see up here, we had a lot of people. There's a toll road to the top of the visitor center, to the top of the mountain by the visitor center that attracts a lot of tourists. Um, so it's great accessibility and there's a lot of beauty up there. So we had plenty, plenty of survey, surveys. Um, yeah, so some challenges that we faced this summer, as you can see here, there was a washout of the toll road, um, basically due to vehicle transportation and um, a weather event here. We had to close some trails. Um, there's a black sedge that popped up, which is a rare species and not usually found on Mount Mansfield, which is very exciting, so we closed that trail. Um, and some people I'd like to thank, there's Dan and Abby. They are Jean, uh, Green Mountain caretakers. Um, so they live and work on the mountain and do awesome work to maintain the trails and the huts and to remind people to stay on the trail in the Alpine ecosystem. And some more thank yous that really helped my experience and learning throughout the summer was Josh and Nigel, both really dedicated to the Green Mountains and to Mount Mansfield as a well. whole. And just a fun collage to um, thank the mountain for a lovely summer and to express the beauty of the summer. So, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Ash. I use she and they pronouns. I'm a junior here at Christine studying environmental science. And this last summer I did my internship on beaver conservation with the Tulip tribes. So the Tulip tribes are an indigenous nation. They're about 40 minutes north of Seattle. You can see sort of where it is on the map. And the goal of the project is to take quote unquote nuisance beavers from suburban and urban areas who were causing flooding or eating somebody's ornamental trees or stuff like that. Um, and they, the project will come in, trap those beavers and relocate them to hydroelectrically impaired areas in the Snohomish watershed, which is in the Cascade Mountains, just east of Seattle. Um, and the hydroelectric restoration has two main goals. One is to sort of reintroduce beavers to areas where they were historically, but they were extirpated. Um, a few hundred years ago um, because of fur trapping, so trying to reintroduce them to a landscape where they once arrived. And the other goal is to excuse me, restore salmon habitat. Salmon are a hugely important cultural resource for the tribe. Um, and also the hydrologic benefits of beavers are very varied and widespread. Um, they create habitat for a lot of other species, can help remove toxins from the soil, and much of really great stuff. So this is a beaver kit, a baby beaver, super cute, um, in a trap that I set, which is really cool. Um, so a typical day on the internship would be very long. I would often have to be at the site where we were checking that day at around 6.30 in the morning, and we wouldn't finish work until like after 5. So um, long day is really hard work, but it was also really fun. We did a lot of cool stuff in the morning. We'd usually check traps. If there was beaver in the trap, you would take it to the Hilo type salmon hatchery, which is where we hold them temporarily before we need to relocate them, um, cut some veg so they have something to munch on, which is what this guy's doing. He just wanted to eat full time. Um, then we might go out to a potential future relocation site, see if it's going to be good, or go to a past one where we released beavers previously, check up on how they're doing. Um, set up some trail cameras to help us with that. Um, if we have a beaver or a beaver family, we to relocate. We would drive out into the mountains two hours, hour and a half, something like that to the site, set them free, which is always super fun. And end of the day, come back, reset traps. Um, yeah, so some key takeaways. I thought it was super cool that I got to be exposed to um, indigenous perspectives regarding conservation. I think that's something that Generally, in the field of ecology and conservation, we don't talk about it enough. So it was awesome to get immersed in that. Um, the traditional ecological knowledge of the tribe is also super fascinating to learn about 
Um, there is also a lot of politics that I found out that goes on um, with these kinds of projects. Like you have to work with the landowners who the theaters property are on, um, state forests, national parks, the state um, fish and wildlife department, all that kind of stuff. I also have to learn about what the day to day you know, work is of a wildlife technician and if that's something that I want to do in the future, which is awesome. Um, and I'm actually from Seattle, so it was also super cool to gain a deeper knowledge of the ecology of what I grew up. So a huge thank you to Molly House, um, coordinator project, who's UVM alumni, which is how I found out about it. Uh, Dylan, the other supervisor, uh, Glenn and Anna Lee, the, the wildlife techniques, technicians had to put up with me making mistakes all the time. <laughs> And the Ruben State School and all the donors who helped make it possible. Hey all, I'm Jess. I need to share your pronouns. And this summer I worked as an independent scientist. Yes, um, I worked with those three people, Kelly, Leslie, and Kate, and we were sampling lakes for the National Lake Assessment and the Next Gen Lakes Project. And it, the goal was to assess the long term health of lakes in the mud. Um, let's see, okay, so that's what our truck looks like. It was really packed. That was like a big part of the internship. <laughs> Playing Tetris to like fit all the stuff in them. That took a really long time. Um, keep going. They insisted on taking a lot of pictures of me. <laughs> there I am in front of the toad or behind it at the veil lab, plankton net, using the hydro lab, using the camera. Um, those are just like instruments that are used for the knowledge and stuff. And so, yeah, it was cool because I got to hang out with cool people. <laughs> um, and I also learned what it's like to work for the state. And yeah, got to understand why we focus on lakes. And it was really fun. Yeah. Everybody. I'm Catherine. I am a senior forestry major and I'll be talking a little bit about my internship experience in the Clement Woodlots of Corinth, Vermont. Um, as a little overview, this property is an hour and a half from Burlington um, and it is one of the various locations studied for the undergraduate um, positions in silviculture and applied forest ecology. Um, and basically, our task was to remeasure plots that had been established in 2020. Um, and basically, these plots, which were situated in 13 blocks, I think there ended up being about 120 of them, um, was to take DBH measurements, um, vegetation counts at different transects, um, small sapling uh, measurements at opposite transects, and then also, of course, weight material measurements. Um, and even though the trees were already marked and tagged from previous years, which may sound easy, um, this is an active harvesting site. So there were a lot of trees that were now stumps, gone or covered in layers of slash. So it was a really fun scavenger hunt. Um, and these are just some pictures of my awesome crew. Um, on the left, it's an example um, of what the plot center would look like, as well as a data sheet where we took all our data collection. Um, in the center, my two awesome crew members, Dakota and Zach, um, taking a vegetation or an understory species sample. Um, those are some examples of the things we would measure. And then that's just a picture of Zach um, taking a diameter at breast height measure. Um, and something else that was really cool is for a week we got to work um, brush sign, which was basically for competition control, mostly getting rid of, rid of all the rubus that was occupying the places and um, also release treatments. Um, so there were about 10 plots where we did this. Um, they were not flat. They were on the side of the cliff and it was very scary at some point. Um, and basically we cut one meter radiuses around predetermined species. Um, in that picture, you can see different flags in different colors. Those stood for those species there. Um, and we did this in every other row to also have another study of 
competition with competition and then with the competition removed. Um, and some takeaways, I worked with two same two same people all summer, so it's mostly let's see if we can make it through the summer without we're wanting to rip each other's heads off. <laughs> and it worked, it was great. And also hands-on learning. Um, as a forestry student, you learn all of these things in the classroom, but actually seeing them in person and identifying these species, especially as saplings, is really hard and fun. Um, respect and patience. And also um, just being able to be in a really, really beautiful forest in Vermont. And I want to say thank you to Tony because he runs this and also Grace Smith, who was our supervisor. Emily and then Kataro. Well, then we're almost done. All right, so my name is Emily Carabello. I am a senior in wildlife and fisheries bio. And over the summer, I worked with Vermont Fish and Wildlife in the small mammals biology working with bats. So, um, so um, just to go over a few bats in Vermont, um, they're kind of a bunch. So we look at mainly cave bats, which are ones that are here all around and will hibernate here, and then migratory bats. So here we mainly worked with the bats that I highlighted. And we also worked with the genus Myotis, which includes little brown Indianas and northern longer bats. And those are the ones that we would see a lot of issues with um, white nose syndrome. So this is me with the bat. This was probably about 12 a.m. Um, so trapping the field was a little brutal, but always fun. So that's a nocturnal. So we would have to go out at night and trap them. So we would set up these big nets. Um, there were two types, there's mist nets and heart traps. So heart traps are used when you know that there is a definite exit, like a bat box or a roost tree. You put it in front, the bats would hit the net and fall into the basket. And then we would take our little jewelry bags, which were like little bags, and put them in the bags and hang the bags on the clothesline and have them ready to process. Um, <laughs> so um, while we were processing, we would do bat banding. So we put a fish and wildlife tag on each bat. So where is she? So this bat right here, that's a female Indiana bat. Um, and she has a band on her forearm. So if she's ever recaptured, we will know and they will be able to say that this is a recaptured bat. Um, we also did basic measurements like um, forearm length here. This is also an Indiana bat and she's a little mad, but um, <laughs> we did forearm length, we did weight. So we would put them in a little pill bottle and a bottle on the scale. And we would basically just get their measurements. Um, we also swabbed for COVID-19 and rabies, which is a new system that's going on in Virginia Tech where they're trying to swab bats and see if they can test for rabies without killing them. Mm. Um, we also did radio transmitting, which is what that bat has in her back. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, and we did some radio transmitting. So this is me in the field after we've tagged the bat with the radio transmitter. And I had to go out with the transmitter and the antenna and wait for a beep until we found one. And this actually resulted in us finding the first colony of Indiana bats, who are a federally endangered species, in man-made structures in Vermont. So we got a interview with uh, Vermont Public Radio and you might have seen our article on VT Digger, which is really exciting. Um, we also did colony counts and um, we basically just went out at dusk and counted how many bats would come out of the roosts. So yeah. I just want to say thank you to Alyssa Bennett and Carrie Monaghan who were my bosses at Fish and Wildlife and they were fantastic. So thank you. Hey, last but not least. <laughs> My name is Kodor Sadducci. I'm a junior in Rubens Dean. I'm a wildlife major. And I worked as an Eastern Mass Tiger Rattlesnake field tech over the summer. A little background the Eastern Mass Tiger Rattlesnake is Michigan's only venomous rattlesnake, or not venomous snake. Um, uh, I was hired as a field tech for the 2022 summer field season. It has been an ongoing project for the last two years. It is a graduate student project through Michigan State University's Applied Forest Wildlife Ecology Lab. 
And we work conjunctively with MDOT, which is the Michigan Department of Transportation and USFW to determine the potential effects of MDOT road maintenance activities on the Beacon Mass Saga Rail site. So basically what I did, um, my daily activities kind of switched, they varied every day. So sometimes we would capture into individuals, you can see me too being a snake. Uh, we have to use a snake hook, so we use the tubes to pin its head so we don't get bit when we're holding them. Uh, when they're captured, we pit tag them so we could ID them later on and we attach little transmitters to them. I don't know if you know, but um, snakes are very hard to raise telemetry because we have to super glue the transmitters and um, snakes shed. So we have to do that probably once every two weeks. And tracking them is also very difficult because they're very, they're pretty small. Rattlesnake species, they max out at around three feet for males. And they live in sun marshes and cattails. So it's really difficult to track a snake miles through cattails where you have to hold the radius on the above to get a signal above the tails. And um, we also did a lot of vegetation and detection surveys. What I gained from my experience, um, I learned proper venomous snake protocol and handling, you know, where uh, I often work independently, so I'd be off by myself capturing these snakes and oftentimes pretty far from hospitals. You definitely have to know what you're doing. And um, learned the use of triangulation with radio telemetry and got hands on experience conducting wildlife management practices and a lot of perseverance and patience spent hours trying to find some snakes and all you find is the transmitter because they dropped it, which can be frustrating for them. We usually would find them for the next few weeks. That's it. All right, so that is all for the presentations tonight. We do have about 15 more minutes, so y'all can leave early or you can ask each other some questions. It was awesome to see your presentations. Thank you so, so much. It was so great to hear from me to you. Get some food on the way out. Like make sure you get a bowl or something to go. And yeah, I'll be seeing you around. So if you have any questions about anything for your internship deliverables, let me know. And it was great to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>